maybe you know their age and sex, you know, you can try and make some guesses about the initial recommendations. Right? So collaborative filtering is specifically for once you have a bit of information about your users and movies or customers and products or, or whatever. Yeah, okay. How does the language model trained in this manner perform on code switch data, such as Hindi written in English words or text with a lot of emojis? And then do you want the second no, question? Or? Separately. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, text with emojis, um, it'll be fine. Um, there's not many emojis in Wikipedia. Um, and where they are in Wikipedia, it's more like a Wikipedia page about, about the emoji rather than the emoji being used in you know, a sensible place. Um, but uh, you can and should um, um, do this language model fine tuning where you take a corpus of text where people are using emojis in, in usual ways. And so you fine tune the wiki text language model to your Reddit or Twitter or whatever language model. And there aren't that many emojis, right? If you think about it, there's like hundreds of thousands of possible words that people can be using, but a small number of possible emojis. So it'll very quickly learn how those emojis are being used. So that's, that's a piece of cake. Um, so I'm not very familiar with Hindi, but I'll take an example I'm very familiar with, which is um, Mandarin. Um, in Mandarin, um, you could have a model that's tra trained with uh, Chinese characters. Um, so there's kind of five or 6,000 Chinese characters in common use. But there's also a romanization of those characters called um, Pinyin. And it's a bit tricky because uh, although there's a, a nearly um, direct mapping from the character, to the pinyin, I mean, there, there is a direct mapping, the pronunciation's not exactly direct. Um, there isn't a direct mapping from the pinyin to the character, because one pinyin uh, is, is, corresponds to multiple characters. So um, the first thing to note is that if you're going to um, use uh, this approach for um, Chinese, you would need to start with a Chinese language model. So actually, um, uh, Fast AI has something called a model zoo um, where we're adding more and more language models for different languages and also um, increasingly for different domain areas like English medical texts uh, or even language models for things other than NLP like genome sequences, molecular data, um, musical MIDI notes and so forth. Um, so you would, you would obviously start there. Um, to then uh, convert that, you know, that'll be in, uh, you know, either simplified or traditional Chinese, to then convert that into a, if you want to do pinyin, um, you could either kind of map the vocab directly, um, or um, as you'll learn, um, these multi-layer models, it's only the first layer that basically converts the, the, the tokens um, into a set of vectors. You could actually throw that away and fine-tune just a, 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 the first layer of the model. Um, so that second part is going to require a bit more, a few more weeks of learning before you exactly understand how to do that and so forth. But if it's something you're interested in doing, we can talk about it on the forum because it's a, it's a kind of a, a nice test of understanding. So what about time series on tabular data? Is there an RNN model involved in tabular dot models? So we're going to look at um, time series tabular data next week. And, uh, but the short answer is, generally speaking, you don't use a RNN for time series tabular data, but instead you extract a bunch of columns for things like day of week, is it a weekend, is it a holiday, was the store open, stuff like that. And it turns out that adding those extra columns, um, which you can do um, somewhat automatically, um, basically gives you state-of-the-art results. Um, there are some good uses of RNNs for, um, for time series, um, but not really for these kind of tabular style time series like, you know, um, uh, retail store logistics databases and stuff like that. 
right? And is there a source to learn more about the cold start problem? I'm going to have to look that up. Um, if you know uh, a good resource, please mention it on the forums. Great. Um, okay, so that is both the break in the middle of lesson four. It's the halfway point of the course. Um, and it's the point at which we have now seen an example of all the key applications. And so the rest of um, this course is going to be digging deeper into how they actually work behind the scenes, more of the theory, more of how the code, the source code is written, um, and so forth. So it's a good time to have a, a, a nice break. Uh, come back, um, and furthermore, um, it's my birthday today, so it's really, you know, a special moment. Um, so, yeah. So let's have a break and uh, come back at uh, five past eight. So, um, Microsoft Excel. Uh, this is one of my favorite ways to explore data and understand models. Um, um, I'll make sure I put this in the repo. Um, and actually, this one we can probably largely do in Google Sheets. I've tried to move as much as I can over the last few weeks into Google Sheets, but I just keep finding it's just such a terrible product. So, um, I, yeah, you know, please try to find a copy of Microsoft Excel because there's, there's nothing close. I've tried everything. Um, uh, anyway, uh, spreadsheets um, get a, a bad rap um, from people that basically don't know how to use them, just like people who, I don't know, spend their lives on Excel and then they start using Python and they're like, what the hell is this stupid thing? I mean, you know, it takes thousands of hours to get really good at spreadsheets, um, but a few dozen hours to get competent at them. Um, and once you're competent at them, you can see everything in front of you, it's all laid out, it's, it's really great. Um, um, I'll give you one spreadsheet tip today, which is if you uh, hold down the control key or command key on your keyboard and press the arrow keys, um, here's control right, it takes you to the end of a block of a table that you're in, and like it's by far the best way to move around the place. So there you go. Um, so um, in this case, you know, I want to like skip around through this table so I can hit control down right to get to the bottom right. Control left up to get to the top left. I'm going to skip around and see what's going on. Uh, so here's um, anyway. So here's some data, and uh, as we talked about, um, one way to look at collaborative filtering data is like this. And so what we did was we grabbed from the movie lens data um, the people that watched the most movies, and the movies that were the most watched, and just filtered the data set down to those uh, 15. And um, as you can see, when you do it that way, it's not sparse anymore. There's just a small number of, here we are, there's a small number of gaps, right? Um, so this is something that we can now build a model with. Um, and so, how can we build a model? Well, like what we want to do is we want to create something which can predict for user 293, will they like movie 49, for example. Right? So we've got to come up with some way of, you know, some function that can represent that decision. And so, Here's a simple possible approach. And so we're going to take this idea of doing some matrix multiplications. Um, so I've created here um, a random matrix. So here's one matrix of random numbers. And I've created here another matrix of random numbers. Um, more specifically, for each movie, I've created five random numbers. And for each user, I've created five random numbers. And so we could say then um, that user 14, movie 
27. Uh, did they like it or not? Well, the rating, what we could do would be to multiply together uh, this vector and that vector. We could do a dot product, right? And here's a dot product, right? And so then we can basically do that for every possible thing in here. We've got the dot product. And, you know, thanks to um, spreadsheets, we can just do that in one place and copy it over and it fills in the whole thing for us. Um, why would we do it this way? Well, this is the basic starting point of a neural net, isn't it? The basic starting point of a neural net is that you take the matrix multiplication of two matrices and that's, that's what your first layer always is. And so we just have to come up with some way of saying like, well, what are two matrices that we can multiply? Um, and so clearly, um, you know, you need um, a matrix for a user, uh, you know, or a vector for a user, a matrix for all the users, and a vector for a movie, or a matrix for all the movies, and multiply them together, and you get some numbers, right? Like, so, they don't mean anything yet, they're just random, right? But we can now use gradient descent to try to make these numbers and these numbers give us results that are closer to what we wanted. So how do we do that? Well, we've set this up now as a, as a linear model, right? So the next thing we need is a loss function. So we can calculate our loss function by saying, well, okay, movie 3, for user ID 14, should have been a rating of 3, with this random matrices, it's actually a rating of 0.91, so we can find the sum of squared errors would be 3 minus 0.91 squared, and then we can add them up. So there's actually a sum squared um, in Excel already, sum uh, x minus y squared, so we can use just some x minus y squared function, passing in those two ranges, and then divide by the count to get the mean. So here is a number that is the uh, mean, uh, the, well, it's actually the square root of the mean squared error. So like you, sometimes you'll see people talk about MSE, so that's the mean squared error. Sometimes you'll see RMSE, that's the root mean squared error. So since I've got a square root at the front, this is the square root mean squared error. Um, so we have a loss. So now all we need to do is use gradient descent to try to modify our weight matrices to make that loss smaller. Um, so Excel will do that for me. Um, them installed. So it's probably worth knowing how to do that, so we have to install add-ins, oh, solver's there, okay, I just obviously forgotten where it was, oh yeah, okay, um, so the gradient descent uh, solver um, in um, Excel is called solver, and it just does normal gradient descent, so you just go data, solver, you need to make sure that in your settings that you've enabled the solver extension, it comes with Excel, and all you need to do is say, which cell represents my loss function, so there it is, V41, right, so which, where is your loss function stored, um, which cells contain your, your variables, right, and so you can see here I've got H19 to V23, uh, which is up here, and B25 to F39, which is over there, um, and then you can just say, okay, um, set your loss function to a minimum by changing those cells, and solve. And you'll see the starts at 2.81, and you can see the numbers going down, and so all that's doing is using gradient descent exactly the same way that we did when we did it manually in the notebook the other day. 
okay? But it's, it's um, rather than solving the mean squared error for a at b in the, uh, a at x in the um, Python, um, instead it is solving the um, loss function here, which is the mean squared error of the dot product of each of those vectors by each of these vectors. Um, and so there it goes. Um, so we'll let that run for a little while and see what happens. Um, uh, but basically in, in micro, here is a simple way of creating a, um, a neural network, which is really in this case, it's like just a single linear layer um, with gradient descent to solve a collaborative filtering problem. Um, so let's go back and see what we do over here. So over here, we used get collab learner. Okay, so um, the um, the function that was called um, in the notebook was um, get collab learner. And so as you dig deeper into deep learning, one of the really good ways to dig deeper into deep, deep learning is to dig into the fast AI source code and see what's going on. And so if you're going to be able to do that, you need to know how to use your editor well enough to dig through the source code, right? And Basically, there's two main things you need to know how to do. One is to jump to a particular symbol, like a particular class or function by like, by its name. And the other is that when you're looking at a particular symbol, to be able to jump to its, its implementation. So for example, in this case, I want to find get collab learner. So um, in most, um, um, in most editors, including the one I use, Vim, you can set it up so that you can kind of hit tab or something and it, jumps through all the possible completions and you can hit enter and it jumps um, and it jumps straight to the definition for you, right? So here is the definition of get collab learner. Um, uh, and as you can see, it's, it's pretty small uh, as these things tend to be. Um, and um, the keys, uh, in this case, it kind of wraps a data frame and automatically creates a data bunch for you because it's so simple. Um, but the key thing it does then is to create a model of a particular kind, which is an embedding dot bias model passing in the various things you asked for. So you want to find out in your editor how you jump to the definition of that, which um, in Vim, uh, you just hit uh, control right square bracket. And here is the definition of embedding dot bias. And so now we have everything on screen at once. And as you can see, there's not much going on. Uh, in, um, uh, so the models that are being created for you by FastAI are actually um, PyTorch models. And uh, a PyTorch model is called an nn.module. That's the name in PyTorch of their models. It's a little more nuanced than that, but that's a good starting point for now. And when a PyTorch nn.module is is run when you calculate the the value, you know, the result of that layer or neural net or whatever. Specifically, it always calls a method for you called forward. So it's in here that you get to find out how this thing's actually calculated. When the model is built at the start, it calls this thing called underscore underscore init underscore underscore. And uh, as I think we've briefly mentioned before, in Python, people tend to call this dunder in it, double underscore in it. So dunder in it is how we create the model and forward is how we run the model. One thing if you're watching carefully you might notice is there's nothing here saying to how to calculate the gradients of the model and that's because PyTorch does it for us. Okay, so you only have to tell it how to calculate the output of your model and um, uh, PyTorch will go ahead and calculate the gradients for you. Um, and so in this case, um, the model contains a set of weights for a user, a set of weights for an item, a set of biases for a user, a set of biases for an item, and each one of those is called, is coming from this thing called get embedding. Um, so let's see get embedding. 
So here is the definition of get embedding, and um, all it does basically is it calls this PyTorch thing called nn.embedding. Uh, so in PyTorch they have a lot of like standard neural network layers set up for you. So it creates an embedding, and then this thing here is it just randomizes it. So this is something which creates uh, normal random numbers for the embedding. So what's an embedding? Um, an embedding, not surprisingly, is a matrix of weights. Um, specifically, it's a matrix of weights Specifically, an embedding is a matrix of weights that looks something like this. It's a matrix of weights which you can basically look up into and grab one item out of it, right? So basically, any kind of weight matrix, and we're going to be digging into this in a lot more detail um, in the coming lessons, but an embedding matrix is just a weight matrix that is designed to be something that you kind of index into it as an array and grab one vector out of it, right? That's what an embedding matrix is. And so in our case, we have an embedding matrix for a user and an embedding matrix for a movie. And here, we have been taking the dot product of them, right? But if you think about it, that's not quite enough because we're missing this idea that like, maybe there are certain movies that everybody likes more, Maybe there are some users that just tend to like movies more, right? So I don't really just want to multiply these two vectors together, but I really want to add a single number of like how popular is this movie and add a single number of like how much does this user like movies in general. So those are called bias terms. Remember how I said like there's this kind of idea of like bias and we, the way we de dealt with that in our gradient descent notebook was we added a column of ones. Okay, but uh, what we tend to do um, in practice is we actually explicitly say I want to add a bias term. So we don't just want to have um, prediction equals dot product of these two things, we want to say it's the dot product of those two things plus a bias term for a movie plus a bias term for a user ID. So. That's basically what happens. We, um, when we set up the model, we set up the embedding matrix for the users and the embedding matrix for the items, um, and then we also set up the bias vector for the users and the bias vector for the items. And then when we calculate the model, we literally just multiply the two together. Just like we did, right? We just take that, that product, call it dot, right? And then we add the bias, and then putting aside the min and max score for a moment, that's what we return. So you can see that our model is literally doing what we did here um, with the tweak that we're also adding a bias. Right? So it's um, it's an incredibly simple uh, linear model. And for, um, for these kinds of collaborative filtering problems, this kind of simple linear model actually tends to work pretty well. Um, and then there's one tweak that we do at the end, which is that in our case, we said that there's a min score of zero and a max score of five. And so here's something to point out. Here's something to point out. So um, if you have um, you know, a range, so you like you, you do that dot product and you add on the two biases, and that gives you, you know, that could give you any possible number along the number line, from very negative through to very positive numbers. Um, but we know that we always want to end up with a number between zero and five. Let's say that's five. And of course this is zero. So what if we mapped that number line like so, this function? 
Okay, and so the shape of that function is called a sigmoid. Right, and so it's going to asymptote to five, and it's going to asymptote to zero. And so that way, whatever whatever number comes out of our dot product and adding the biases, if we then stick it through this function, it's never going to be higher than five and never going to be smaller than zero. Now, strictly speaking, that's not necessary, right, because our parameters could learn a set of weights that gives about the right number, right? So why would we do this extra thing if it's not necessary? Well, the reason is we want to make life as easy for our model as possible. So if we actually set it up so it's impossible for it to ever predict too much or ever predict too little, then it can spend more of its weights predicting the thing we care about, which is deciding who's going to like what movie. So this is an idea we're going to keep coming back to when it comes to like making neural networks work better, is it's about all these little decisions that we make to basically make it easier for the network to learn the right thing. So that's the last tweak here, which is we take um, the result of this dot product plus biases, we put it through a sigmoid, and so a sigmoid is just a function, it's basically 1 over 1 plus e to the x, the definition doesn't much matter, but it just has the shape that I just mentioned, um, and that goes between um, 0 and 1, and if you then multiply that by max minus min plus min, then that's going to give you something that's between min score and max score. Um, so that means that this tiny little neural network, I mean it's, it's a push to call it a neural network, but it is, it's a neural network with with one weight matrix and no nonlinearities, so it's kind of the world's most boring neural network, um, with a sigmoid at the end. That's actually, um, well I guess it does have a nonlinearity. The sigmoid at the end is the nonlinearity. Just It only has one layer of weights. Um, that actually turns out to give um, close to state-of-the-art performance, uh, like I've looked up online to find out like what are the best results people have on this MovieLens 100k database, and the results I get from this little thing are better than any of the results I can find from like the standard commercial products that you can download that are specialized for this. Um, and the trick seems to be that adding this little sigmoid um, makes a big difference. And did you have a question? There was a question about how you set up your Vim, and I've already linked to your .vimrc, but I wanted to know if you had more to say about that. What do they want to know about Vim? They really like your setup. You like my setup? <laughs> There's almost nothing in my setup. Um, it's pretty bare, honestly. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I mean, whatever you're doing with your editor, you probably want it to look like this, which is like, when you've got a class that you're not currently working on, it should be, this is called folded. This is called folding, right? It should be closed up so you can't see it. Um, and so it, you basically want something where it's easy to close and open fold. So Vim already does all this for you. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, you also want something where you can kind of jump to the definition of things, um, which in Vim it's called using tags. Um, so if I want to jump to the definition of learner. Uh, basically, Vim already does all this for you. You just have to read the instructions. Uh, my VimRC is minimal. I basically hardly use any extensions or anything. Um, uh, another great uh, editor to use is uh, VS Code, uh, Visual Studio Code. It's uh, free and it's it's awesome um, and it has all the same features that you're seeing that Vim does. Basically VS Code does all of those things as well. Um, uh, I, I quite like using Vim because I can use it on the remote machine. Um, and play around, but you can of course just uh, clone git onto your, um, uh, the git repo onto your local computer and open it up in VS Code to play around with it. Um, just don't like, don't try and look through the code just on GitHub or something, like that's going to drive you crazy. You need to be able to open it and close it and jump and jump back. Um, maybe people can create some um, threads on the forum for Vim tips, VS Code tips, Sublime tips, whatever. Um, uh, yeah, for me, I would say, like, if you're going to pick an editor, 
If you want to use something on your local, I would go with VS Code today. I think it's the best. If you want to use something on the terminal side, I would go with um, Vim or Emacs. Um, to me, they're, they're clear winners. Um, so what I wanted to close with today is to kind of um, take this collaborative filtering example and describe how we're going to build on top of it for the next three lessons to create the more complex neural networks we've been seeing. And so um, roughly speaking, um, you know, this is the bunch of concepts that we need to learn about. Um, let's think about um, let's think about what happens when um, when you're using a CNN uh, to or you know whatever a neural network to do image recognition. Um, basically. Let's take a single pixel, right? You've got lots of pixels, but let's take a single pixel. So you've got a red, a green, and a blue pixel, okay? And um, so each one of those is some number between 0 and 255, or we kind of normalize them so they're, you know, floating point between, well, with the mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. But let's just do the zero, you know, let's say whatever they're like. Do the 0 to 255 version, so it's like 10, 20, 30, whatever. Okay, we'll come back. So what do we do with these? Well, what we do is we take, we basically treat that as a vector, and we multiply it by a matrix, right? So this matrix, depending on how you think of the rows and the columns, let's treat the, the matrix as having three rows, and then how many columns? Well, you get to pick, right? You get to pick, just like with the um, collaborative filtering version, I decided to pick a, a vector of size five for each of my embedding vectors, right? So that would mean that, that that's an embedding uh, basically of size five, right? You can get to pick how big your weight matrix is, so let's make it size five. Okay, so this is three, by five. So initially, this weight matrix contains random numbers. Remember when we looked up get embedding weight matrix just now, and there were like two lines. The first line was like create the matrix, and the second was fill it with random numbers. That's what we do, right? I mean, it all gets hidden behind the scenes by FastAI and PyTorch. But that's all it's doing. So it's creating a matrix of random numbers um, when you set it up. And uh, the number of rows has to be three to match the input, and the number of columns can be as big as you like. And so after you multiply the vector, the input vector, by that weight matrix, you're going to end up with a vector of size five. So people often ask, like, how much linear algebra do I need to know to be able to do deep learning? This is the amount you need, right? So. And, and if you're not familiar with this, that's, that's fine. You need to know about matrix products. Okay, you don't need to know a lot about them. You just need to know like math and like computationally, what are they? What, what do they do? And you've got to be very comfortable with like, if a, you know, a matrix of size blah times a matrix of size blah gives a matrix of size blah. Like, how do the dimensions match up? So if you have three, and then remember in NumPy and PyTorch, we use at times 3 by 5 gives a vector of size 5, okay? Um, and then what happens next? It goes through an activation function, such as ReLU, which is just max 0, comma, x, and spits out a new vector, which is, of course, going to be exactly the same size, because no activation function changes the size. Right? It only changes the contents, so that's still of size 5. What happens next? We multiply it by another, uh, another matrix. And again, it can be any number of columns, but the number of rows has to map nicely, so it's going to be 5 by whatever. So maybe this one has, you know, 5, say by 10. 
And so that's going to give some output. It should be size 10. And again, we put that through ReLU. And again, that gives us something of the same size. Okay. And then we can put that through another mat uh, matrix. Actually, just to make this a bit clearer, you'll see why in a moment. I'm going to use 8, not 10. So that these. Let's say we're doing digit recognition, right? So there are 10 possible digits. So my last weight matrix has to be 10 in size, because then my, that's going to mean my final output is a vector of 10 in size. And do you remember if we're doing like digit recognition, what happens? We take our actuals, right, which is 10 in size, and like if the number that we're trying to predict was the number 3, that's our, like, that's the thing we're trying to predict, then that means that there is a 3, 0, 0, 0, in the third position. Right? So what happens is our neural net runs along, okay, starting with our input, and going weight matrix, ReLU, weight matrix, ReLU, weight matrix, final output, and then we compare these two together to see how close they are, how close they match using some loss function. We'll learn about all the loss functions that we use next week. For now, the only one we've learned is mean squared error. Um, and yeah, we compare the actual, we can think of them as probabilities for each of the 10, to the actual each of the 10 to get a loss, and then we find the gradients of every one of the weight matrices with respect to that, and we update the weight matrices. So the main thing I wanted to show right now is the terminology we use, because it's really important. These things contain numbers. Specifically, they initially are matrices containing random numbers. And we can refer to these yellow things as, uh, in PyTorch they're called parameters. Sometimes we'll refer to them as weights, although weights is slightly less accurate because there can also be biases, right? But, you know, we kind of use the terms a little bit interchangeably, but strictly speaking we should call them parameters. And then after each of those matrix products, that calculates a vector of numbers. So here are some numbers that are calculated by, uh, let's use this one. Here are some numbers that are calculated by a weight matrix, multiply. And then there are some other sets of numbers that are calculated as a result of a ReLU, as a result of the activation function. Okay, either one is called, are called activations. So activations and parameters both refer to numbers, right, they are numbers. But parameters are numbers that are, are stored, they're used to make a calculation. Activations are the result of a calculation, the numbers that are calculated. Right? So they're the two key things you need to remember. So use these terms, right, and use them correctly and accurately. Right? And if you read these terms, they mean these very specific things. So don't mix them up in your head. And remember, they're nothing weird and magical. They're very simple things. An activation is the result of either a matrix multiply or an activation function, okay? And a parameter are the numbers inside the weights, inside the matrices that we multiply by, okay? That's it. And then there are some special layers. So every one of these things that does a calculation, all of these things that does a calculation, are all called layers.
they're the layers of our neural net. So every layer results in a set of activations because there's a calculation that results in a set of results, okay? There's a special layer at the start, which is called the input layer, and then at the end, you just have a set of activations, okay? And we can refer to those special, I mean, they're not special mathematically, but they're semantically special, we can call those the outputs. Right? So the important point to realize here is the outputs of a neural net are not actually like mathematically special, they're just the activations of a layer. And so what we did in our collaborative filtering example, we did something interesting, we actually added um, an additional um, activation function right at the very end. Right? We added an extra activation function, which was sigmoid. And specifically, it was a scaled sigmoid, go between zero and five, right? And that's really common, right? Um, it's very common to have an activation function as your last layer, and it's almost never going to be a ReLU, because it's very unlikely that what you actually want is something that stops, at, that truncates at zero. It's very often going to be a sigmoid or something similar, because it's very likely that actually what you want is something that's between two values, okay, and kind of scaled in that way. So that's nearly it, right? So we've got um, inputs, weights, activations, activation functions, which we sometimes call nonlinearities, output, and then the function that compares those two things together, right, is called the loss function, which so far we've used MSE. Um, yeah, okay, and that's, that's enough for today. So what we're going to do, um, what we're going to do uh, next week is we're going to kind of um, add in a few more extra bits, which is we're going to learn the loss function that's used for classification, which is called cross entropy. We're going to use the activation function that's used for single label classification, which is called softmax. And we're also going to learn exactly what happens when we do fine tuning in terms of how these layers actually, what happens with unfreeze and what happens uh, when we create transfer learning. So, <laughs> thanks everybody, um, looking forward to seeing you next week.